Human beings have long sought to cover the vast distances of the Earth more quickly and comfortably. Technological advancements have led to means of transportation like the airplane and the ocean liner. But what technology cannot always address are the unforeseeable things that can happen between a starting point and a destination. Very often this takes the form of unpredictable weather and the results can be tragic. Thursday, May 28, 1914. In the harbor at Quebec City, crew members of the Empress of Ireland are loading provisions for the Atlantic crossing to Liverpool. Since its maiden voyage in June 1906, the Empress has become a favorite of passengers making the cross-Atlantic journey. Some make the trip as a vacation, others on the return passage as a means of starting a new life. Well, CPR shipping lines played a major role in the transportation of immigrants to Canada. Well, Canada, and certainly Maritime Canada in 1914, transported themselves in what we now look upon as rather old-fashioned ways, with the great ocean liners being a large part of their transportation in those days. The Empress is one of the fastest and largest ships making the North Atlantic crossing. May 28, 1914 will be the Empress's 96th voyage. Of the 1,057 passengers and 420 crew, few have safety on their minds as they board the ship in Quebec City. The ship will leave Quebec City, take the St. Lawrence past Rimouski, a small village on the southern shore, and then out into the Atlantic on its way to Liverpool. Water continues to rush into the Empress. In first class, Frank Ernest Abbott tries to help Mabel Hackney and the injured Lawrence Irving. He was having trouble putting on her life jacket and he helped them get his, her life jacket on. And then they told him, look after yourself, old man. And, that's, and they, they went upstairs on deck. Abbott realizes that time has nearly run out. Well, my grandfather jumped over the rail into the water, and he was pulled under three times by the undertow. And apparently Abbott uh, did glance back once he was in the water, having grasped onto some kind of a, um, a piece of wood floating, and glanced back and, and saw them on the railing, you know, clasping each other, and, and apparently that was one of the last memories they have. In second class, Bill Hart struggles to guide his panic-stricken family off the ship. With the ship tilting beneath them, the young Saskatchewan family navigates with hundreds of other panicked passengers through the dark, upstairs and onto the deck. James Hannigan and his family are also in the grips of terror. Legend has it that feeling his end is near, Hannigan gives his life vest to another passenger. At 2.09, the Empress of Ireland rolls over on her starboard side. And 2.10, the Empress of Ireland sinks. This is all over in 14 and a half terrible minutes in the dark. If you survived at all on the Empress of Ireland, it was more a matter of luck than anything else. It is just over a half an hour since the Empress first spotted the Storstad. In minutes, a peaceful night on the St. Lawrence has turned into a horrifying race to escape the Empress. Minute by minute, the luxury liner sinks deeper into the cold waters. Sunday, August 11th, 1957. A charter flight bound for Montreal from London has flown directly into a heavy thunderstorm just west of Quebec City, near the small village of Isodon. Captain Norman Ramsey is unable to gain control of his plane in the heavy turbulence. The DC-4 becomes a dead weight falling from 6,000 feet. 
For those on board, it is like a waking nightmare. Planes going straight down, you really don't have a lot of time to think about anything. Terrified passengers and crew, like stewardess Anne Harvey, and passengers Leonard Wartz and James and Hilda Brickett, have little time to brace themselves as the ground approaches. The DC-4 falls from the sky. Below deck, stowaway Edward Cronin feels the punch of the first blast. It is nothing compared to the explosion that follows. Some people, like my uh, little cousin Edward, were just blown to bits. In the ship's saloon, the explosions hurl Will Kennedy and Clayton King into the air, knocking them unconscious. Arthur Penrod is killed as he is blown towards the back of the ship. Harry Sargent is behind a post that shields him from the full impact of the blast. When the first explosion happened, there was essentially a ball of gas that shot through from the stern of the vessel towards the front, and Sargent recounts feeling this, you know, coming alongside of him. From all the accounts, Frizzell was one of those men who were blown off the vessel with the explosion, like literally blown out on the ice. The last eyewitness account saw him uh, struggling to get up. And then I believe there was another explosion. Brighten herself up. Alphonse pulls his younger brother back to the sinking boat, and they climb to the top of the wheelhouse. I looked up, my old man was on the bow of the boat, hanging on for dear life. And the set line that we had on that broke clear from the nets happened to fall on his hand. That's how come he, he saved himself. The other boats have seen the Francine D capsize, but Bernie Jenkins' boat, the Alda Marie, is closest to help. As Bernie brings her dangerously close, his nephew Cyril tries to get a lifeline to the two boys. And the second time he hit its mark, my hand, and uh, I passed the noose around everyone I have ever under his arm bits and around his body. While Bernie and Cyril haul Everett to the Alda Marie, on the Francine D, Alphonse can see that his father Jack is drowning in the pounding sea. With Everett on board the Alda Marie, Bernie makes a third pass, and Cyril hits his target again. But this time, Alphonse crawls to his father on the bow. He was still hanging on for dear life with one arm, so I passed the rope under the other arm. I told him, hang on to that. He did with one hand, but he wouldn't let go of the anchor. So the line at that time was getting tight. Then there's a wave come and wash him off of the bow, over and over the foredeck, and I started hauling. He must have had a death grip because he did not have enough life in him to hold on to nothing. As Bernie circles around again, something catches Alphonse's attention. I happened to look down, and William George was in the steering cabin. His head was completely bald, and he was split from ear to ear. So I kind of leaned over the top of the cabin and slid the door shut so his body would come in with the boat. On the Alda Marie, as Bernie makes his fourth pass, his nephew throws the rope to Alphonse one more time. I didn't wait to be hauled over. I got it by one hand and I took off, and I was some glad to get out of there. It is a moment neither Alphonse nor his rescuers have time to savor. I was moving towards the, the, the wheelhouse again when I seen this big wave come, pop come down and hit us just lifted us right out of the water. The boat went down again on the starboard side and split with all the planks on our starboard side. The engine turned around off this bed as well. So there we were. We were a cripple. Captain Esther sets his altimeter to indicate his height above the ground. In the cockpit, Esther and Dressar begin the turn that will land them safely. What they don't know is that the powerful northeast wind has pushed them 35 kilometers southwest past Gander, where the ground elevation is higher. As the plane banks down through the clouds, the hills suddenly come into view. Dressar is the first to realize that they have gone wildly off course. They believed that they were approaching Gander. At that last minute, their co-pilot he was concerned about hills in the area. 
the last moment they decided to pull up, but it was too late then. Stewardess Jean Rooks is fastening her seatbelt when she hears a loud bang. Student John King hears the plane hit the trees. You know, he had some premonition of, of trouble. So when they actually hit the first trees, he said he took his seatbelt off, which is totally counterintuitive to everything that everybody ever tells you. But he felt like he would be safer. He just said, well, I just thought it'd be better to take it off. Now, in the initial part, people would not have really known that they were crashing. It was just more turbulent. So from the time they realize it's maybe three quarters of a second that it takes to really understand a situation is happening that's not normal, to the time that the plane stopped, uh, a couple of seconds. The DC-4 plows into the forest. Wings, propellers, and gas tanks break away. The momentum catapults Captain Jean Esther against the windshield. He dies, still strapped in. Albert Dressard is crushed in his seat. In the cabin, the tremendous impact causes the passengers to pitch forward. Saturday, April 23, 1943. The fanid head, a steamship in a military convoy traveling in dense fog, collides with the fishing schooner, the Flora Alberta, with 28 crew members on board. It was disastrous in as much as you get a sort of a 10,000 ton ship running into a, a, a small wooden schooner. The steamer's heavy steel hull drives through the schooner, practically cutting the wooden ship in two. Below deck on the Flora Alberta, the impact from the fanid head startles the crew. At the time of the collision, Uncle Ira would have been jolted awake. He may have heard the shouting of the man just prior to the collision. It's hard to imagine what would go through your mind realizing that the ship you're on was now smashed into pieces and that you were going into the water and not knowing what was going to happen beyond that. In the opening seconds of the collision, the fanid head lurches forward. Captain Heddles yells out orders as he regains his footing north into Canada, regaining some of its strength as it pushes across the Gulf of St. Lawrence toward the island of Newfoundland and the men fishing its shores. The howling monster that descends on the French islands of St. Pierre and Miquelon on September 12, 1900, is like nothing the French fleet fishing there has ever seen. The fishing fleet at St. Pierre and Miquelon was decimated by this storm. Nine schooners and 120 men are known to have lost their lives. As the storm continues its savage sweep along the Newfoundland coast, fishing schooners on the Grand Banks are rocked by violent winds and giant waves. On the Lilydale, Captain William Edgecombe and his tiny crew fight for their lives as they try to reach the nearest harbor. And that was their only hope of survival. They would have been accosted uh, by high waves and tremendous wind. In order to survive, to be driven before the wind, they would have been uh, lashed the sails and the wind would have carried them along. I can't imagine it. Wave after wave after wave. And the wind blowing, living gale. Nothing can stand it, nothing. Not even a big ship. It's probably tied to the wheel, I don't know. Because that's what they usually used to do when the weather was bad. Maybe it was thinking about his son, my son, and the one he had home and his wife. 